Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Also want to welcome those that are listening on the radio or watching on the live stream. Uh, glad to have you all gathered in worship. Um, I'm Pastor Dennis Preston and grateful this morning for Pastor Aaron sharing the uh, message today. Also grateful for all those who helped to prepare this worship space uh, for our worship. There's the Altar Guild, there's Karen Haskamp and Sherry Martin, and our custodians for the AV team, our ushers, greeters, and our pianist, Russ Bunker, and also for this service, the Crosswalk Ministry, uh, which is, uh, we're listening to recorded today. Once again, we'll be celebrating communion together. Those that are listening on the radio or watching the live stream uh, may join us in communion, provided you have wine or grape juice or, and uh, bread and, and cracker uh, prepared. Also, uh, here in the sanctuary, you've been given this little pre-packaged wafer and, and grape juice. Uh, they're a little tricky if you haven't dealt with them before. There's a, a clear white layer on top You'll need to uh, get that first, and then you can uh, reveal the grape juice after that. So we'll talk about that more uh, when that time comes. Uh, Family Sunday School is continuing through May 23rd. That's from 10 to 10.15. Uh, if uh, an adult isn't uh, available to come with a child, why one of the other uh, families will be glad to adopt them for that half hour. So be sure to, to come. Coming this week, May 6th, is National Day of Prayer on Thursday, and uh, there'll be uh, the ministerial, the pastors from town are gathering uh, downtown at the um, Northern Pacific Park, the one with the turtle slide, and that'll be from 12 to 1 uh, for that event. And then New Member Sunday is coming on May 23rd. So if you know of someone or if you yourself would uh, like to become a member of Calvary, uh, please, uh, by the end of this week, why make that known to one of the pastors or to uh, the office and um, preparation for that. Uh, happy birthdays in order to uh, Carrie Petromet. Her birthday was Friday and Russ Bunker. Uh, his birthday is tomorrow, so we are thankful for all of them. Happy birthday to you as a crew. And Erin has an announcement. I just want to say a word of thanks um, from the youth stock. This was the first year that our family was able to experience it, and so I want to say thanks both as a pastor but also as a parent. There were two things that I really noticed um, with my son having gone to it, and that was youth don't often get a chance to talk on the phone. And so this gave them some experience and some practice. And so I thought that was kind of neat that it offers that opportunity for them to call people they don't know or some that they do and to be able to, to talk with them over the phone. The other thing that I just um, really became apparent to me was when my family came home and my son said um, he couldn't believe how much the church had supported them. And so I just think that was really neat for the youth who were there. I'm going to guess for all of them to hear of the church prayers and also um, financial support. So I just want to give thanks for all of you um, for supporting that ministry in some way. And also, I know one person who had a youth call, she said, after they said thank you for the support, she said, you're worth it. And so I'm just grateful for all of you and the ways that you are able to support our youth here. Thank you. Thank you, Calvary. Please stand as you're able for Thanksgiving. Uh, as we give thanks for the gift of baptism and also share our need for forgiveness. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Cleanse our hearts, the things we have done and left undone, things known and unknown that have harmed our neighbor. 
Wash us in your forgiving grace. Shower us with life. We praise you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Send us companions on our journey as we share in your life. Make us one, risen Christ. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. The opening song is The Heart of Worship by Crosswalk. Christ infusing rain 
the boughs will shout for joy again when autumn cools and youth is cold when limbs their heavy harvest hold then through a swarm the Christ will move with gifts of beauty, wisdom, love. As winter comes, as winters must, we breathe our last return to our souls take wing and trust the promise of the spring. Christ holy vine, Christ living tree, be praised for this blessed mystery that word and water thus revive and join us to your tree of life the grace of our risen savior the love of god and the communion of the holy spirit be with you all let us pray gracious god Nourish our life in Jesus' resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. It's now children's time, and for children's time today, I'm wondering if someone would like to volunteer. Any volunteers? Ben's all over it. Okay, so... For today, I have this piece of paper, and I'm going to cut a circle in it, and I'm wondering if you think you can walk through. 
If I cut a circle in this piece of paper, do you think you can walk through, Ben? No, okay, anybody think he can get through if I cut a circle? We'll do this after church, not during, okay? Okay, well, we'll come back to that. So uh, there's a sign on this piece of paper. What is the sign? Do not enter, enter. and so what does do not enter mean? Don't go there, there. yeah, don't go there, right. Well, as I'm cutting here this circle, I'm gonna try to talk at the same time, so we'll see how that goes. It worked for the first service, but we'll see. All right, so if you think about our lives, there are groups that people are a part of, and are there ever any groups that people feel like they cannot enter? What groups come to mind for you when you think about that? Any groups come to mind that you feel like people can't? What's that? Okay, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Any other groups? One person at the last service said school. So I know I've seen groups of youth together, like maybe eating, and sometimes there's one person on the outside. So whether they've been excluded or that person feels like they can't enter, they can't be a part of the group, right? What are some other groups? Can you think of any? What about church? Does anyone ever feel like they can't be a part of church? I know that there are people that have told me they don't feel like they have the right clothes for church. So they feel like they can't dress up enough and they could never come to church because they don't look right or they don't feel like they're good enough. Do you think that's true? Yeah. Do you think people should be welcome though, no matter what clothes they come in? Or Yeah, so God wants all people to be welcome. I was thinking about, I'm going to start here in a little bit, um, cutting a, making this circle a little wider. Do you think you can get into it yet, Ben? What do you think? Well, I'm going to start cutting the circle a little bit wider. Have you ever been a part of a circle, and you're in this circle, and then more people come, and you have to make it bigger so they can fit in? That happens quite a bit, right? And so I'm going to start making this circle a little bigger. Um, so God wants us to expand the circle. God is always working to expand the circle, and that's one thing we're going to hear in our next reading, is expanding the circle to welcome people that might not feel like they can be welcomed. And so God kind of does that sometimes in really surprising ways. So, Ben, do you think you could get through this circle now? Yeah, so we'll try that a little bit later, and if anybody else wants to try to walk through the circle, we had one adult do it at the last service and a couple youth, so um, you are welcome to try it. But I think when we think about church and about people who are welcome, we always want to try to expand it a little wider. And so this week, we might think about that at church if we see someone we haven't seen here before, or next week, what's a way we can really help them to feel welcome like they belong? Or when you go to school, or when you're at different things this week, is there a way we can kind of expand our circle? If we see someone like standing outside playing, wanting to play basketball but not able to play or four square, can we welcome them and invite them in? Let's pray. We thank you so much, God, that you welcome us into your family. And we pray that you help us in what we say and do to welcome more people that they feel truly welcomed by you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, we are going to turn to our reading today from Acts, but before we get into that, one scholar points out that at the beginning of the book of Acts, Jesus sends his first disciples, his apostles, to go and be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And that's this promise he gives, and that promise comes true in our reading today. Now, this reading comes on the tales of persecution. So the church has been persecuted in Jerusalem, and that scattered the followers out further. Some of the disciples have gone out to minister and then they've headed back to Jerusalem. We're going to meet Philip in our reading and Philip doesn't go back because the Holy Spirit has other things in mind for him. The Holy Spirit sends Philip on a wilderness road. So not into big, some big bustling city center where he'll see all these people and can tell them about Jesus, but he sends them to a wilderness road. And I don't know about you, but if I were Philip, I would be like, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, what good can I do here? And yet, we know that God often shows up where we least expect it. So here's Acts chapter 8. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. 
So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom may I ask you? Does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Now, when you hear this man described as a eunuch, what thoughts come to mind? When you hear him described as an Ethiopian eunuch, what assumptions do you make about him? Think about how do you feel toward him? As I've read this story in the past, I've often thought of this man as an outsider. I've maybe even pitied him because he's a eunuch, for he is headed to Jerusalem to worship there. But in Deuteronomy chapter 23, it reads that people like this eunuch are not to be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. He is not to be welcomed into the assembly of people worshiping because he's a eunuch, whether it was by accident or someone did this to him. And I had learned from one of my former teachers this week that empires would sometimes castrate sons of kings who weren't in line for the throne so that they would not be a threat to the son who was in line for the throne. And then they would become like kind of leaders in the government because they weren't a threat to him. But they would be fiercely loyal because if that king then were killed, all the eunuchs, his siblings, I would assume, would be killed with him. Now we don't know if that's what happened to this man or not. But there is more to his story than what we first might guess. So I read that Deuteronomy reads that he should not be admitted to the people who worship God. But then, if you jump ahead to Isaiah, which happens to be the scroll he's reading from, just a few chapters later from where he's reading, it reads, Thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. There's this incredible word of promise, and you wonder, has that promise happened yet? Or is he still waiting? When he went to worship in Jerusalem, was he welcomed? Or was he kept out? As we look at this man, we also notice that these labels, Ethiopian eunuch, these are not all he is. For this man has some power. He's in charge of a whole treasury. He commands a chariot. He can read. He also has a coveted scroll of the prophet Isaiah, which was not easy to come by in that day. And when he hears news of Jesus, he is able to immediately apply those promises to himself. This man has far more depth than what his society or ours would grant him. It reminded me of a TED Talk that I'd heard several months ago by author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She's originally from Nigeria, and she did a TED Talk called The Danger of a Single Story. And I'm just gonna share a couple of the stories she shared. 
She talked a little bit about her own life and that she was from a middle-class Nigerian family. She said her father was a professor and her mother was an administrator. And like other middle-class families, they would have live-in help to help around the house. And when she became eight years old, a houseboy came to live with them named Fide. And she said the only thing my mom told me about Fide was that his family was very poor. They would send food to them and their old clothes to them. And when she didn't finish her dinner, see if this sounds familiar to any of you, her mother would say to her, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? How many of you have done that before? <laughs> we tell one story about someone. So she felt enormous pity for Fide's family. And then one day, they went to visit his family in their village. And when they came, his mom pulled out this beautiful basket that Fide's brother had made. And she said she was startled because she couldn't imagine that his family could make anything. All she thought they could do was be poor. She had made that one story into the whole story about Fide. She said she thought about this years later when she left Nigeria to study college in the United States. And when she came, her American roommate was shocked by her. She wondered how she could speak such good English and was confused when she said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She also asked if she could listen to her tribal music. And the roommate was very disappointed when she handed her a tape of Mariah Carey. <clears throat> She said what struck her was this, that her roommate had felt sorry for her before ever meeting her because she had seen one image of Africa, an image of catastrophe put up again and again and again, and she thought that's all there was, that there was no possibility of Africans being similar to Americans, no possibility of a connection as human equals. Now, she did say there's been plenty of catastrophe and challenge in the continent of Africa, but that that's not the whole story. There's also incredible resiliency and creativity and innovation happening there, which we don't hear. As we think about her words, and as we think about this man from Ethiopia, think about what stories or labels do we put on people? Who have we heard about or seen images put up again and again that seem to be one descriptor, one image, and we think or we've made that to be the whole story? Might we expand our vision of people's stories by hearing them tell their own stories instead of what someone else has told us about them? Or might we search for other sources when it's a whole group of people to learn more and expand our understanding of these fellow people who have also been made in the image of God. Now, if we go back to this man from Ethiopia in our Acts story, we try to open up his story a little more to see him as more than the labels that the story gives him, to see him as a fellow human being who ends up taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. That was a job first given to the apostles, and now it's lived out in him. And one of my former teachers noted that today the church in Ethiopia is booming, it is thriving, it is expanding. And we see today that it began on a wilderness road by a man whom many at his time would have just dismissed. One more thing. While Philip helps this man to know Jesus, Philip does not bring God to him. He's already wrestling with scripture and wondering what is God up to. I heard several years ago that the church, we don't go out to bring God to people. We go out to see where is God already working out there. While we may be able to name it and name Jesus at work, we go out and see God already working and we're just asked to join it. When this man hears about Jesus, it is him, not Philip, who asked to be baptized. It's him who says, what is to prevent me from being baptized? In other words, what is to prevent me from receiving the overflowing grace of Jesus? What is to prevent me from joining Jesus' people? And he knows the answer is nothing. 
Nothing can prevent him from belonging to Jesus. Nothing can prevent him from being a part of the kingdom of God. And as we look around at people today, as we look around at our world, we see people that we have made into just one story. What is to prevent them from belonging to Jesus Christ? The Ethiopian eunuch gives us the answer, nothing. Nothing should separate people from knowing the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. If we all but go out and witness to it. Might the Holy Spirit nudge and keep nudging each one of us to keep getting to know someone new, to hear their whole story. Like the Holy Spirit nudged Philip, might the Holy Spirit nudge us to go out from this place today and look for and see what God is already doing in the people around us, to name it, and then together share in Jesus' welcoming and life-changing grace. Amen. As we come to God in prayer, I invite you to uh, respond with the words, your mercy is great, after, each, after I say the words, we praise you, O God. So alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you sent Philip and the other disciples with the good news that Jesus' love, baptism, and salvation are open to all. Encourage your whole church with your word and fill us with your spirit as we seek to expand the circle that we too may be witnesses to your love. We praise you, O God. Your mercy is great. You have created the heavens and the earth. As we wonder at the beauty of creation, we give thanks for the amazing splendor. Help us to see the vital connections among all that depends on the earth for life. We praise you, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule the nations with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence that they lead not by fear, but with love for those they are called to serve. We pray in this time for equitable distribution of the COVID vaccine. We praise you, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, weak, or fearful. Provide for the needs of all, especially those we name in our hearts. We praise you, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for Calvary in the search for a faith connection coordinator and for all the ministries of Calvary and beyond. We praise you, O God. Your mercy is great. And you gather us with all the saints by the power of your spirit. With them, may our hearts live forever in your keeping. We praise you, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So in this time of COVID, we're not able to move around and shake hands, but you can share the peace with a sign or uh, some other uh, a wave or something. So the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share the peace with one another. And sometime during the day, if someone comes to mind, uh, share a, a word of encouragement with someone with a text or a card or some other way to be connected. I also want to thank you for uh, 
all the ways you give of yourselves, your offerings, your time, your talents. Um, so just thank you for all those ways that make Calvary and ministries beyond Calvary to happen. Thank you so much. Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and, and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world for the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. So please stand as we prepare for Holy Communion. Please do not open your uh, cup and bread until after we pray the Lord's Prayer. So you may lift up your, uh, your little cup at this time. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. You may lower your cup. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Be sure, first, the, the clear plastic on the top, a uh, little hard to, to get sometimes, reveals the bread, and then... Uh, the, the heavier tab for the wine. Receive these words from, from Jesus about this uh, gathering, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And for those of you not uh, yet taking communion, hear these words for you of blessing. Jesus loves you and is always with you. Amen.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and until eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May our gracious God grant you the spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Christ, the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. This time we'll hear from Crosswalk, Lord, reign in me. Please stand as you're able. Christ is risen. Christ is risen Go in peace, share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.